Welcome to the weekly update of the Sri Lanka Medical Association on COVID-19. Uh, which is a very important academic activity that is conducted by SLMA. So today also we have a panel of eminent experts with us who will be discussing and explaining us about the current situation and because it's very important for us to take a scientific evidence-based approach on this and uh, also to uh, follow the scientific principles in facing this challenge and the threat. So we will be uh, starting with a brief discussion of the current situation. In summary, as a country, Sri Lanka has been doing well and a uh, lot of credit should go to the Sri Lankan citizens, health professionals and the health ministry, the government and the tribe forces. They have done a very good job uh, in keeping the situation under control so far. However, I think our doctors as well as, as, well as a country would like to know the current situation because the country, they have made many sacrifices. They have sacrificed their religious, cultural events and their social activities, all these, and facing a lot of inconvenience. So a lot of credit should go to our Sri Lankan citizens for keep helping to keep this situation under control. So let us start with a brief overview of the current situation. And uh, in this, uh, regard, with regard to this Sri Lanka Medical Association, working in collaboration with the WHO and the Epidemiology Unit uh, and the Ministry of Health have developed a mathematical and a statistical model for predicting the future situations. And this was done under the leadership of Professor Manoj Veerasinghe and uh, then uh, Dr. Nishantha Pereira from the Mathematics Department. I will first invite Manoj to uh, share his views about what would be the future and how can the country progress, what are the plans uh, to share very briefly with us. Manoj, over to you. Uh, yes, uh, you know, it's good afternoon. <laughs> right, uh, just giving a very brief uh, account of what's happening at the moment. Basically, there are a few things I need to stay at the very beginning. There has been different uh, people, different individuals, different groups saying many things about this epidemic for last about two, three or four weeks. Looking at all those and uh, looking at it more scientifically, I will give a very brief account. First thing is, in looking at a, actually an epidemic, there are several basic principles that you really need to adhere to. You have to look at where the actual epidemic is. Whether it's a controlled type of epidemic within special groups or it is a widespread epidemic going and spilling over to the community. Up to now, with the second case of uh, COVID we detected on 11th of March. Today it's almost one month has passed. So if you look at this whole one month, we have only got 190 cases and seven deaths. And if you really look at uh, what's uh, happening in other countries, you just cannot compare our situation just looking at the numbers in other countries because the contexts are very different. In our country, our basic uh, control programs, measures started even before the first case was diagnosed or detected in this country on 27th of January. Even before that, when the, when the, when the news came out that there is an epidemic possible epidemic in China and it's spreading. The Sri Lanka Epidemiology Unit and the Ministry of Health have taken many steps. And then the army and the tri forces came into the picture and they have done an excellent job that nobody can actually uh, refuse. And that is why almost after about uh, two and a half months after detecting the first case, we are still in a platform where we can 
prevent this epidemic spilling over the community. At the moment, if I can just tell you, if you look at these 190 cases that has been detected and the seven deaths, apart from just one or two cases where they are still investigating of the original index case, all other cases have been traced very clearly to an index case. This index case is either coming uh, directly from overseas or a close family member of a overseas returnee or someone who have associated this uh, person who came from outside or the family member who is with COVID and that is the situation at the moment. Therefore, we still don't have any evidence, I would rather say scientific evidence to stay, say that there is free spreading of this, of free transmission of this virus in the community. So that is the basis uh, that we are looking at and that is the basis on the scientific evidence have shown us. So we have to be very clear about it. So still we do are not seeing a community spread. All the cases that we have seen has a very direct link to an index case which has some connection to a returnee from outside the country. So within that context actually uh, uh, we developed a model almost now about over two weeks back three weeks actually we developed the original model and we have we have uh, presented it almost two weeks back to the Ministry of Health Epidemiology Unit with a very good discussion and attendance from all quarters. Then uh, Ministry wanted uh, us to the same day in the afternoon uh, to present it to the DG and the other people who were uh, the DDGs and high authorities in the Ministry. And uh, the Ministry from what I understand now is working on the projections that we have given to look at the resources needed for this whole uh, operation of COVID and looking at the HR and other things and supplies. So it, that is where we stand at the moment and we had the opportunity yesterday to present uh, this model to the His Excellency the President in front of all the specialists plus the army and other officials and I think we had a good reception there and the military and the others were with <coughs> agreement with our predictions. So if I can you give you a very brief understanding, these predictions of any kind in an epidemic is given or done for a very clear purpose. The purpose is for the decision makers at that particular decision making level to take, be informed and to take decisions. The models and mathematical models and projections are not for public consumption because the public or the media, if you look at, there is a huge variety of audiences that you see and all these mathematical models are based on clear mathematical and epidemiological assumptions and these assumptions and uh, those mathematical basis of a model can be understood only by relatively a small group of people who will take decisions at the Ministry of Health and the hierarchy with the support of others at the political level. Yeah, yes, so, so shall we uh, quickly move into the yes, uh, projection? That is why I am going to tell it, but I have to very clearly tell the basis of this. So what I am going to tell is, on, uh, depending on the uh, data we had on 25th of March, we did a prediction to say that if the restrictions applied on 20th of March to be continued, we will have number of cases uh, on April, first week of April. The number of cases depends on the application of the methods that we use to restrict or social distancing, social gathering, hand washing. If those go at least for a reasonable amount, we predicted 
the case load the active case load will be around 137 cases on 4th of april what i am telling is active case load is the case load or the people we have to care at a given point in time this is not cumulative numbers cumulative number would be the active case load plus those who recovered plus the death so at the moment we actually uh, the actual case load on 4th of april was 135 which is exactly on our line of 137 and up to now today's 10th and uh, the active case load today is 134 so our predictions from the uh, data till 25th of march we have gone through and shown that still within the cluster and it is under control but in addition looking at the possibilities of leakages or spill over to extended contacts immediate contacts are those who are immediate contacts of the index case or the case extended contacts are contacts of the immediate contacts so if we we thought that to have a prediction model we need to get more uh, data on the game so we look at 5% 10% and 25% leakage to the extended contact we we'll, so that if it is 5% leakage it will be about 163 cases of active cases by 7th of april if there is a 10% leakage it would go up to about 340 by 17th of april and there would be extensive leak of about 25% it would go beyond 1400 cases by the end of april or beginning of may but i had very clearly stated looking at the restrictions applied curfew and total lockdown of certain clusters there are about five clusters now totally locked down in the country because of those issues we have been able to contain this epidemic on the up predictions on april 4 can i get the next slide just to show how it goes if you look at the dark blue line it is the predicted level that we were uh, predicting from the model for april 4th peak and going down 5% is the dotted red line blue dot red line is the 10% leak uh, dotted line of blue and the thick uh, red line if we lose control so we are nowhere close to that from our predictions we are almost on the actual data that we see actual cases we see so we personally think we are still in a very good control within these clusters and the primary duty here is to prevention of these clusters giving it to somebody else and beyond the clusters so i think um, the minister of health particularly epid unit and the forces have done excellent job we have helped them in a lot of ways to do this predi giving predictions to look at how to do things and i think this is how we are looking at but i have to tell one more thing if we lose this side if it goes to some for some unfortunate reasons to the community i think it will be extremely difficult to contain this in sri lanka and the discussion that we are having in certain media that we need 500 600 icu beds i think is not going to be useful because to get when we need 500 icu bed there should be at least 11000 cases active cases <clears throat> think about our health system we will not be able to sustain our health system for example for me looking at health system if we exceed about 1000 active cases in the health system it will be extremely difficult to retain the health system there will be definite disintegration but on the other hand if we go in this line i think we have a, a golden line where the next incubation period will be ending on 19 we have sent a report to the top and uh, the some of the decisions were taken based on that if we can contain these clusters by that time we are on the exit strategy from the, the curfew at least for those areas where we don't see any cases and there is no transmissions at least within clusters so there is hope uh, after next incubation period for slowly getting to the normal life of the country getting exit from the curfew getting exit from the lockdown but 
we may have to maintain the strict physical distancing stop any social gathering even in school or other places but open them gradually within next couple of months thank you yeah so thank you manish the, the key message is that uh, currently the situation is very much under control and it has to be kept under same control and probably uh, if you can maintain that within few weeks uh, hopefully the gradual relaxation can occur that too has to be based on the scientific evidence and the epidemiological principles so uh, thanks thank you manoj for providing that excellent overview about the current situation and what the future holds for us and the predictions based on different scenarios now we will be moving into a different aspect Uh, recently there have been lot of discussions about testing methods and uh, there are a lot of discussions about the uh, pcr and rt pcr and q pcr so here we have several experts uh, experts on molecular biology and uh, then the experts on immunology with us so we'll be uh, getting their overview first uh, we have dr chamindri vitarana senior lecturer from the faculty of medicine colombo uh, who is a senior lecturer in biochemistry and has special training uh, in uh, pcr and rt pcr methods uh, in the world in our centers dr chamindri would you like to explain at in, in simple language uh, what is been by pcr how it is conducted and uh, what is rt pcr and again what is the basis hello yeah i'll explain it in a very simple way uh, so the pcr stands for polymerase chain reaction um, this is a method used widely in molecular biology to make millions to billions of copies of a specific dna uh, this allows us to take a very small sample of dna and amplify it to a large amount using pcr copies of a very small amount of dna sequences are exponentially amplified in many cycles of temperature changes a pcr is a, a common and often um, crucial technique used in medical labs and also clinical labs to gain a large amount of dna starting with a very small amount and uh, the difference between rt pcr and pcr uh, rt pcr stands for reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction normally transcription means dna becoming rna that means the process of constructing a messenger rna molecule using a dna molecule as a template in this technique we call it reverse transcription that means the transcription process is reverse here the rna is RNA is the template. In the first step, the RNA is reverse transcribed into DNA. We call it the complementary DNA or the cDNA, and we use an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. After the cDNA is made using a PCR, the cDNA is amplified by many thermal cycles. And um, RT-PCR is one of the most sensitive techniques for RNA detection and quantification. i think it's a it's a very clear explanation of what is pcr and uh, what is rt pcr and how it is conducted and uh, how it facilitate a very specific almost 100% accuracy of detection provide the samples are well collected it provides almost 100% direction uh, detection in accurate accuracy in direction uh, yeah uh, dr shamini thank you for that very clear and very simple uh, description now uh, we'll move into the testing part uh, into the testing part we have i think uh, dr chinnaya with us rohan chinnaya are you there rohan hello hello rohan yes yeah uh, dr rohan chinnaya is a consultant microbiologist and uh, uh, he was previously a senior lecturer in the faculty of medicine kalamu now he's working in brunei so rohan uh, one thing we want to know is when it comes to the diagnosis of covid-19 uh, what do you recommend as the best diagnostic test and when it comes to screening 
at this point right, particular right. recommendation right and now that. in the present sri lankan context where we have to trace have the initial diagnosis or the early diagnosis in that setup the best diagnostic method will be the rt pcr because uh, like some people are clamoring for the antibody test the antibodies will be only coming to the minimum detection they say according to uh, rcpa document it will take about 7 uh, to 10 days so within that 7 to 10 days we, there is a chance of missing the cases and that cases can go around spreading the infection which we don't want to happen because up to now we have been able to so we have to keep that on so the best test is that at this moment will be the rt pcr hello have i answered the question yes yeah. can you go ahead and then explain uh, yes and so uh, for for diagnosis the the best test or the gold standard at the moment would be the rt pcr uh, yeah what can you say about say screening and what would be the future say when we start the gradual relaxation they are then they are maybe need to screen certain categories uh, then what is your recommendation well at that point probably the antibody testing may be a, a bit useful because then we will know who are infected at one point but right at the moment i think the test will be the rt pcr because i think we have not come to that stage when we come uh, come out what we are going to do because today there was a news item to say that there has been an antigen test that has been approved by usa where they are test uh, getting the viral antigen from the nasal swab that has a good uh, sensitivity and specificity and that can give the results in 45 minutes so unlike rt pcr where we have to wait for hours the antigen testing may be useful if we could get on to that rather than the antibody testing yeah as so, however as it is uh, in the current situation what you recommend would be rt pcr yes I mean, correct in the sri lankan context okay. exactly yeah uh, can you share a little bit about uh, your experience in brunei also i mean uh, now uh, currently you are working there and probably the situation there is very much under control uh, uh, but, uh, right yeah. uh, well do you want to know about the containment methods or the probably probably, probably maybe sri lanka can learn from those experiences as well so what 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 was the most effective method was it the the quarantine the contact tracing and or testing or was it a combination it was a combination because we started getting the case on the first of uh, the 9th of march it was one case and within four days we started getting 25 cases but we already had the pre planning all the teams are ready like the swabbing team the contact tracing team and everything so all were set in mode and we quarantine all the contacts and we had housing schemes like uh, to quarantine the hotel rooms ready to quarantine people and also what else we did was that we closed the borders and everyone coming through the border was to be quarantined so we were able to catch all the cases all the contacts treat them and at the same time we were able to prevent new cases being imported into the country so that we were able to because brunei similar to sri lanka has got only one international airport but an entry point whereas sri lanka is blessed in a way that we don't have land entry point we have got only uh, air entry point at katunayaka maybe matala so if we could control all that i am sure we should be able to control the new imported cases yes uh, yeah man thank you rohan now dr shirani is also here pramod can we get dr shirani on board the mm -hmm. president of the college of my yes dr shirani now uh, what can you tell about now sri lanka's current policy uh, that the of testing now the ministry has decided to go ahead with the rt pcr and then uh, now the ministry has started the the community surveillance as well and they have planned for community surveillance so what are the comments that 
you can make on that and what are your recommendations related to the related to increase in the testing capacity dr shirani actually in the care we have increased our testing capacity not only in central places but now the test is available in ratnapura jaffna new provinces as well so our testing capacity has increased that's there's no argument about it and epidemiology unit has planned screening of the contacts and community screening all that so with that we will have lot more samples coming in uh, and with the proce processing of those samples we will know more about our uh, stage how, how we are having the disease in the country yes uh, now the the ministry's current strategies now they have moved uh, from testing the symptomatic now they have moved into the community surveillance in a, in a sampled manner in the clusters and after that they'll be moving that's the first level contacts and after that they'll be moving to the next level based on the on the findings of the first level contacts what do you think about this policy i mean are we moving in the right direction right direction actually it's the first level of contacts who so far who got the disease and second level the casual contacts so far they are not infected so our policy should be screening then go for the casual not for the casual but immediate contacts yes uh... I, I think there, it was once mentioned that there was a discussion with Professor Malik Piris also, and uh, he also suggested that the Hong Kong experience there was that uh, the most of the yield of positives were from the first level contacts, and there was not much of a yield from the second level, low levels beyond. So, do you uh, think it would be the same scenario that would be experienced in Sri Lanka as well? Yes, uh, with the available limited information, it's. like that like the hong kong scenario like the hong kong scenario okay yeah there are some questions uh, there's one question what is the type of test for an antigen detection test but as far as we know at the moment uh, we are using only the pcr test uh, dr shirani would you like to answer or maybe uh, dr rohan or dr chavin riyadia uh, 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 are there available antigen test detection test or are they just at the kind of experiment or evaluation level there are available test but who recently issued its position on these yes yes and they say it's still at research level still at research level so yes. so you you your current advice as well as the who's policy is to go for the rt pcr at the moment with the available uh, information um, that is our decision but we are evaluating the situation all the time because at, at this stage lot of research going around the world yes yeah yeah something comes up we might change our stand but yes yeah at so, the moment yeah. this is the best approach i think at the moment it's the best approach approach but you are keeping all the options available and lot of evaluation is happening yes. related to the antigen as well as antibody am i correct in uh, stating in that way yes. uh, could you repeat it in the yeah i mean the the so we currently we are going uh, according to the best practices and best evidences and who recommendations and sri lanka is moving ahead with uh, with a, a formalized plan uh, having said that there are uh, evaluation going on related to the antibodies and there is research going about on about antigen as well am yes. i correct in mentioning yes, yes. Yes. and uh, now uh, there is some pressure for mass scale uh, screening using rt pcr or using antibodies what do you think i mean as support to sri lanka's current policy uh, the initial policy of detecting the patients then move into the first level and the next levels compared to that policy what do you think about this uh, pressure coming in the push coming in related to mass scale screening Uh, i'm not 100% sure at this stage we need to go for that type of screening okay this we are in 3a stage family clusters in small communities but if you it's later on i think we are going for a serious surveillance to see how 
our population is infected with that. We have the missing asymptomatic or some whether the disease was introduced earlier than we think that type of arguments are going on. So yeah. a serious surveillance will give answers for that. But yeah. at the moment, I think mass scaling, mass scale screening may not be the ideal thing. Rather than we have to concentrate on close contacts. Close contacts. So, I mean, the Sri Lanka successful uh, strategy has been identification of the contacts and then uh, preventing the spread of the disease. Yeah. And uh, I think, uh, Terence, uh, Rohan, do you want to add to what Dr. Shirani is telling? No, no, uh, I totally agree with what Shirani says. Uh, as he says, the antibody testing can, we can do it at a later stage to screen the people to see whether there has been an infection previously and how many people have been infected. Uh, but I totally agree with what Shirani says. Okay. Yeah. So thank you. So that, that has given us a very clear idea about the, uh, the current testing policy that is happening and the rationale of what it is based on. And there are a lot of comments coming in and most of the comments are in agreement with this policy that at the moment there is no place for mass scale screening, but the current stepwise process that Sri Lanka is following probably the appropriate method as far as the country is concerned. So uh, most of the comments are along those lines. Uh, yeah, uh, then uh, moving into mo uh, moving into the management part, moving into management part, uh, do we have Dr. Puldisanayak on board? Uh, yeah. Yes, Upul, yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Dr. Upul is one of the experts and he's from the College of Physicians, Sinon College of Physicians. Upul, can you share uh, your experience on current management guidelines? I mean, we are aware that uh, recently the College of Physicians have updated their management guidelines into version uh, version four. And uh, then the, the case definition has also, has also been revised. Would you like to tell about that? Mention briefly about the case, the new case definition. Amod, I think uh, you have to unmute Dr. Pool. Ah, yes. yes. Uh, now, first of all, it's, it's, the, it's the case definition. Now, uh, when we when we started this, it was mainly the foreigners, the, the the people who came from abroad, and the connections with the people who had come from abroad. Now we have broadened the definition because this uh, uh, people who have returned within the last fourteen days does not apply anymore. So what we say now is the whether you have had the contact with a person who have returned from abroad. Uh, say something like this Italian crowd or, or from the, the from uh, uh, Korea first and then whether you have had any contacts with the COVID positive or COVID suspect patient and third thing is that whether you are from high risk area say if you if you are from Nigambo with the the respiratory symptoms you are you are more likely to have a COVID positivity than a person from Monaragala so those are the, the three main categories. One, the, the COVID suspects or COVID positive people and the people uh, who have had uh, close contacts with the, the people who have returned from abroad. Third thing is uh, the, whether you are from a very high risk area. Uh, there are two more things like uh, if a patient uh, is sent by the community, the, the regional epidemiologist for testing, whether the patient has symptoms or not, we test. But now the contact is the main thing and the patient should have two more things. The fever during the, the course of this clinical illness plus respiratory symptoms. The respiratory symptoms, the main symptoms are the sore throat, cough or shortness of breath. Uh, if I reiterate, it's the, it's the presence of symptoms which is fever during the course of the illness or uh, so plus the respiratory symptoms plus the contact. Am I? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's very clear. So now the, the the current criteria has somewhat been relaxed compared to what it was. Yeah. Can can you brief the doctors in this audience about the the current management protocols? 
Yes. Uh, now, now uh, I'm not expert on this, but uh, now we, I am in one of these committees which discusses the the treatment protocols. So, what we practice at the moment is only one drug, uh, that is hydroxychloroquine. Uh, the patients at IDH are given hydroxychloroquine, uh, 200 milligram BD for 10 days. Uh, everybody. Uh, the other drugs are not given. Say other drugs like tocilumab and methylprednisolone, which are which are uh, sort of which were projected to have some benefit. Uh, the, the the Sri Lankan government health ministry has not approved on on expert uh, guidance. So, uh, yeah, at the moment it's based on the available evidence, and there are a uh, lot of discussions uh, and a lot of discussions suggestions regarding certain drugs uh, which are still under evaluation uh, stage yeah so uh -huh. current, yes uh, yes. yes every 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 day morning there's a there's a group of uh, professionals in this field they yes. get together we have a, a clinical uh, clinical uh, pharmacologist uh, the epidemiologist the microbiologist and the physicians get together in the morning every day and discuss the current management strategies and what where we are heading and at the moment, what I can say from this morning's uh, discussions, that we are happy to give only hydroxychloroquine, no other drug. Yeah, so, so that is Sri Lanka's current policy. Yes. Yes. And, uh, yes. and uh, now, uh, Dr. Pul, what, uh, what is the current the, the algorithm for the referral? Say if someone is complaining of symptoms or if they feel that they are not well, what's the current algorithm that the ministry recommends? So should they go straight away to a hospital or should they call someone and call a doctor through a helpline and get advices? And what kind of protocol is followed at the moment? Uh, at the moment, the Ministry of Health doesn't advise the people to go straight to a hospital. They are given uh, two hotline numbers and I understand the SLME has another hotline. Yeah, that's two uh, Two four two four seven two four seven yeah. two four seven and if it is from a landline it is about one, uh, one, one two four seven, seven. yes yes and the ministry has I think one triple uh, nine and one three something I'm not sure and they they call a call center the call center assesses the the symptoms and if the symptoms are suggestive of COVID they send a suicide to that person's place and the patient is brought to the hospital that is to minimize the 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 spread of the illness uh, if the pay, person uses the public transport and the other side is that the host, the country is on a curfew and you will not be able to use your own vehicles so they are brought in by the suicide to the opds at the opd you are triaged the, the history is taken again and we have developed a checklist uh, according to the checklist you are the, the chances of you being COVID is assessed and the patient, if the patient has a high risk of being COVID, high risk in the sense depending on those criteria, the patient goes to a sentinel hospital. The sentinel hospitals are the hospitals which, are, which have a isolation facility and testing facility for suspected COVID. If the person goes into another hospital, the patient is kept in the hospital in the isolation area and then transported to a sentinel hospital where the COVID testing can be done. Uh, and if your symptoms are not suggestive of COVID, but if your symptoms are that of a respiratory illness, there are still a chance of you being COVID. So those patients are not tested straight away and they are not going to be in the COVID board, but they are going to a respiratory area which can be part of a board or a different ward which sort of keeps the respiratory people together uh, keeping the distancing and sort of the people using more of the the the, the, the protective equipment in that ward yeah uh, yes then uh, again uh, what, what is the current icu preparation uh, are you in a position to respond yes to that? yes 
uh, the ICUs currently, uh, there are two places which run ICUs for the, the COVID positives, but that is IDH and the other hospital at Velikanda. Uh, the IDH has eight beds, Velikanda, to my knowledge, has six. And when the capacity is full, Mullaria will be taken over. Mullaria hospital is being prepared with ICU beds. There will be eight ICU beds. I don't know how ready they are with the, with the cubicles and the beds. And then next stage is KDU, where there are about 40 beds. I'm not sure the exact numbers. So that is where we are, say now. It, according to international standards, if we have, uh, say, the 5% the of the people with symptomatic COVID will need ICU beds. So uh, now if we have, say, at the moment, I think we have about 60 altogether, 60 or 70. If it is 60, I'm not good in the maths itself. So uh, 60 into 20, 1,200 patients in the community uh, should be, we should be able to sort of accommodate but if the if the if the case load is more uh, there will have to be more icu beds so where are these icu beds is the next question and we are advising the government to have the icu bed prepared in base hospitals outside uh, in in other provinces so the problem is, if I move on, the, the, the people, when the COVID are given the ICU beds, the other patients, the non-COVID ICU, uh, the people who need ICUs, who have better chances of recovering and going back to the community, are deprived of ICU beds. So this is a debate. At the moment, we are preparing a document advising now, uh, Indika, you have prepared, you have sort of allow, allocated yeah, yeah. people to discuss about the ICU preparedness. Yeah. yeah. So, what my, this is my personal opinion. We should not reduce the the care given for non-COVID people exactly. who have better chances of recovering, and we should not take over the ICUs in, say, now you know that we have only 580 ICU beds in the country. Say, if we take over 200 ICU beds and the 200 the people with COVID who go there, the only the 160 will die and 40 will recover. And the, the people who needed these ICU beds, the non-COVID people will all die in medical wards. So there is a dilemma that we have to address. So, so the message that you are giving is what we really need to do is to prevent the situation into getting into that level and uh, use uh, preventive measures to make sure that the situation is kept under control. At the same time, we have to make sure that other patients, uh, the routine patients care should not be deprived. Am I correct in? Uh, you are very correct, Indika. You are very correct. The sad situation in the country is that uh, a patient with fever is considered a COVID. A patient from Putlam is considered a COVID. And a patient who has a trap gun injury coming from Putlam, the people don't want to touch him until COVID is excluded. So this is a sad situation there. So uh, has, has it, that led to into a mass panic situation that would adversely affect our health system? Uh, yes. If you if you look at if you look at uh, the hospital that I work in, it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a sad situation. Uh, the medical ward complexes work well, but the moment the patient goes, a uh, fever patient goes to a maternity hospital, a surgical ward, a uh, uh, neurosurgical ward, uh, comes to accident service, uh, they are in a panic mode. So uh, they, there are a lot of calls to the, the, the physicians who are looking after the, the COVID intake during that week, exclude COVID until then we don't touch him. So this you have to address as this. Let me present. That's my that's my request, yeah. and we should we should reduce this fear psychosis, which is partly created by the media hype, and we are responsible for part of that. I, I think, uh, Doctor Paul, you have spoken very clearly and very directly, straightforward. Yeah. So again, again, your message is that uh, the care for other patients has to be continued. And, and may I add, yes, may please, I add a little please. more, sir? Yes, the, the addition is that now we are given a respite by this, the community measures. 
we are yes. keeping the epidemic under control yes but if we don't make some icu beds and we are if you are looking at sort of taking over these other icus all over the country for covid we will have covid deaths and non covid deaths so this respite has to be take sort of used to improve the so to build up new icu beds in the country we may not be able to utilize them and sort of use them to cure the covid patient there will be mass deaths but at least at the end of this epidemic we will have now you know the icu situation in the country is pathetic and we will have more icu beds for the country and if the if the base hospitals can be prepared with new icu beds at least for each hospital you can upgrade the hdus so that is what we should be doing during this respite given by the 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 epidemiological measures thank you thank you yeah uh, there is one question i think we have already given the answer to that question that is is a uh, hcq given as post exposure prophylaxis in sri lanka i suppose you have given that answer previously no so, we are not giving it we don't give post exposure prophylaxis uh, it has to be positive covid positive by pcr only and uh, and those patients should be symptomatic and in in a covid hospital and uh, asymptomatic people we don't give it yes i think you you have been very clear uh, thank you dr paul thank you and, uh, yeah and uh, so then there is a question on uh, now if we keep this very tight control there is one comment that we will be ending up uh, with the best case prediction with a rather low number of patients being infected so how can we uh, would the with, with that be a problem with a large proportion of citizens not immunizing it's a difficult question is uh, professor nilika here nilika pramod is dr nilika available uh, she was there a while ago but uh, right now she is not online ah, okay so i think this this question is about the herd immunity part yes uh, so dr uh, dr rohan would you like to comment then Uh, well i don't think i am an expert in yeah. that uh, but nilika will be the best best person but before the herd immunity develops uh, I, we don't know number one we don't know whether these antibodies that are produced are protective antibodies uh, and we don't know whether they are going to be long lasting antibodies uh, so I don't yeah. think I'm a best person to answer that no. but these yeah. are the questions in my mind all questions in your mind so probably uh probably it, it it may not be the best uh kind of strategy uh that that what, what you are thinking about isn't it yes yeah i don't know yeah i am not yeah. the best person to answer that okay thank you yeah uh krishanth now there are some questions coming from uh, say uh, what's with the situation in india becoming worse are we prepared to stop movement of suspected patients probably we are not in a position to answer that question but the answer that is coming from the navy is that they are very much uh, they have really protected the borders of the country the sans are coming and they have given a guarantee there and there's another comment coming from dr ravi rananeliya that uh, the country's current testing capacity is not adequate and uh, so krishant would you like to uh, respond to those comments manush Uh, yeah yeah so, so i think uh, about, this about protecting are, the borders yeah yes there are two things first one is uh, what sorry what's happening uh, on the borders i think the try forces and the defense would be the best people to tell uh, something about it from what i understand is they are actually looking and uh, trying to protect the borders that is what we hear yes there is a possibility because we see close movements from southern india to parts of our country so there is a possibility and that would be a huge danger to particularly the certain places in the east and the northern coast so we know up to now we don't have a issue on those areas because what we had in jaffna is almost resolved at the moment very few things happening there so what i feel is the dry forces are looking particularly the navy are looking at it and if 
in case that people are smuggled or come to these areas we may have to have another uh, strategy on those i am not in a position to tell more than that second one that uh, was told about the uh, adequate testing or whatever so issue is i think there is a very clear government policy then there is a road map which has been uh, designed by the epidemiology unit looking at what we need at this time of the epidemic i think every decision has to look at yeah. the present public health response to the issue and how are we going to do testing on as a part of this public health response at the moment what i is uh, find is the road map that has been very clearly uh, designed and is now implemented in the ground level is uh, is adequate up to now but it does not mean that we get should get ready to what uh, we have to expect particularly when we are opening up areas relax in curfew and relax in the airport but we have to be very clearly understand this is a country in sri lanka our resource levels and we also have to look at and uh, see what's happening in the other countries most of the people think that uh, the, there is serious testing in other countries no if you look at us uh, what some documents that we see in certain areas in us unless they are really ill they are not testing that is why clinical suspicion is also needed to uh, take care of patients and to uh, send to proper facilities where they will test there i don't at this moment i don't think that we should go on uh, on expanding our testing uh, i'm not telling capacity but testing on ground level without a reason i think that was the clear explanation given by dr malik peeris when he said at the moment the priority is to look at the immediate contacts screen them or uh, test them and see whether they are locus or focus of other infections i don't think uh, we need to go beyond that on the government policy yeah so uh... yeah so that is uh, the suggestion that we have to go by the government policy here yeah my krishanta i'll get back to you again uh, yeah. as well yes mm, now we are actually running short of time we need to finish it by one uh, dr ravi ranandeliya want to mention about herd immunity But at the moment it's a rather contentious issue dr ranandeliya can you be very brief uh, about the Uh, the hong kong experience so if you can mention very briefly that would be fine but uh, uh, probably this may not be the moment to start discuss in detail about the herd immunity can you very briefly comment about the herd immunity part that you want to mention hello can you hear me yes yeah yeah okay i have three very quick comments one is on herd immunity there will be basically no herd immunity so uh, given our current scenario and in most countries less than 3 4% of the population will get infected in our case it will be you know 0.1% so basically we will be uh, completely open to future epidemics for at least the next 18 months till we have vaccine that's number one and that just want to say another on the border control issue which was raised we cannot safely open our borders until we have testing capacity to manage that and we do not have the testing capacity that's the hong kong approach that's the singapore approach all those countries now uh, when they had the airports open until a few weeks ago had started mandatory testing of everyone so if we want to open the airport india is a, has a huge epidemic right now it's hidden if we want to open the airport or sea borders we will have to be have the ability to test thousands of people and i should emphasize there is no guarantee that any of these things work perfectly so we will have low running epidemics maybe a, you know a few cases a day and i think the government policy is wrong we cannot plan for testing needs today we have to plan for testing uh, i needs think uh, yeah uh, dr ananali if you can limit your comment to oh. the herd immunity part that would be fine because okay. uh, yeah 
Yeah. So, yeah. so thank you, thank you very much for making that comment. So, a sense of your comment is that even now, even if this brings to a control like R not value less than one, still there may be issues. It might come up from certain times. So we have to be prepared, and we need to rewire our systems to coexist with COVID for certain time to come. Okay. Uh, in conclusion, now again, Prashant, the planning for the future based on the predictions. Uh, what is your final word? Yeah, basically, uh, with the technical committee meetings on in the Ministry of Health and uh, some meetings that we have at the highest level, the planning is on for an exit strategy for what we are seeing at the moment. But this exit strategy is a very planned strategy, not sudden release of all the things which would give a surge of cases and a very severe peak uh, in about two to three incubation periods. So people are discussing it. There are plans for the exit strategy and it is being done. And I'm not in a position to give any more details. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you. So a sense that is coming after all these discussions is uh, Sri Lanka is uh, very much on the correct track related to the detection and the control of the disease. And we need to plan for the future. And we have to base our plans uh, on the scientific basis, the predictions uh, that is again based on science and uh, learning from experience from other countries as well. So basically in a sense coming down to the scientific approach and uh, uh, we have to be in compliance with the government and the Ministry of Health Mechanisms and all of us need to work together uh, if we are to face this challenge successfully. In conclusion, I thank all of you for your active participation and your active contribution. And it's very valuable sharing all this valuable, precious knowledge with all of us. And thank you, thank you again, and let's meet in one week's time. Thank you, have a nice day.